when I lived in the Netherlands, uh, even though you work on a, a project that you hope fixes something, like plastic recycling, at the end of the day you go to a supermarket to buy something, like a banana shipped from Colombia, then uh, you sleep in a house that is built from concrete, uh, then you take a car somewhere, um, so I, I felt, and then you have all the roads that are there, the lights that are always on, just sort of to keep that Dutch system going. Uh, it's not necessarily a Dutch system, I think it's just a Western system. Uh, they leave big footprints, uh, way more than people in other countries in the world, the Western world. Uh, so I, I felt very much like, damn, you're trying to fix problems, but you're here part of the problem just by living in this world. How should I structure life or how can we structure life that you can still work on these things, but meanwhile you don't make a mess somewhere else. You're listening to the Spaceship Earth podcast with me, Dan Burgess. The concept of the Spaceship Earth is simple. We live on a life-giving rock called Earth hurtling through space. Like a spaceship, we have a finite amount of supplies with an intelligent operating system, which keeps everything we need replenished as long as we all respect it and use wisely. So an understanding of how this system works, along with deep cooperation between humans and all life, is essential to keep us thriving and the spaceship flying. In this podcast, I'm in conversation with humans involved in regenerating life, shifting consciousness and reimagining how we can live more beautifully and peacefully. I talk with artists, Activists, writers, designers, adventurers, healers, entrepreneurs, creative mavericks, and more. Their stories invite us to participate in the co creation of a more beautiful, life sustaining world in service to life, becoming crew on the spaceship Earth. Hello, welcome to the podcast. Uh, this is Dan. Thanks for tuning in. Much appreciated, as always. Uh, hope this finds you well, wherever you are. In this episode, I'm in conversation with designer Dave Hackins. Now, Dave has created the positively disruptive uh, and creative platform Precious Plastic, uh, the internet sensation that was phone blocks and his new mission, a platform seeking to disrupt the fashion industry by helping people create new fashion from old fashion, a project called Fixing Fashion. Uh, Dave is a designer, but uh, not maybe as you might know design. You see, Dave is focusing his design skills on fixing the mess that, well, design creates when we make things in ways that soon become out of control in our world, which aren't designed with how nature works, for example, which, let's face it, is most things, which create mess, pollution, waste, massive resource and energy use, environmental destruction and uh, general planetary meltdown. Dave has decided to figure out ways to tackle that and do it while creating community and having a laugh. He focuses on prototyping, learning through doing, and sharing everything open source so everyone can work together, learn together, and grow together. He's a total maverick in my view. I think his thinking is at the very forefront of design right now on the Spaceship Earth. Um, And with the recent launch of new participation platform One Army, which brings all of these projects together, this is how they frame it in their own words. As you might have noticed, we as a civilization are kind of screwing things at a planetary scale, big time. One Army is a group of people from around the world working on global problems affecting the planet and humanity. Problems like plastic pollution, the growing amount of e-waste, fashion, or the footprints we leave on Earth by just living our lives. These are very complex, big, and interconnected issues. However, these problems are created by humans, and we think humans can fix them. This will require many hands and brains, many people, like an army of people. So there you go. Let's cut to this one. This is The Spaceship Earth, episode 48 with Dave Hackins. Enjoy. Dave, welcome to The Spaceship Earth podcast. Well, thank you. Um, Good to have you here. Whereabouts on The Spaceship Earth are you right now? I'm, uh, I'm currently in Portugal. Ah, yeah. yes. So this is, we'll get into this. This is your um, 
this is one of your new projects, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. Whereabouts in Portugal are you? Uh, around Santa Comadão. It's a bit more in the north of Portugal. Okay. It's a bit more rainy nice. there. Yeah, I saw... Um, I got a vibe. I got a rain vibe, actually, from watching some of your films. Um, there seems to be a rainy, rainy spot. Um, and um, and how and how are you doing? Because you've been there, like you know, it's obviously been a bit of a bit of a crazy, uh, crazy year for for everyone. Um, how are uh, how how are you in amongst all of this? I'm I'm good. Uh, it kind of feels to me like the world got affected more by this year than me personally my year is always a bit messy yeah uh, so actually now it my year felt a bit more stable than usually maybe so. yeah that's that's um yeah there's a lot in that isn't there actually I, I sort of i think i can i can appreciate that vibe of everything feeling a bit um messy and all over the place generally i think when you're working on the edges of of <laughs> of change you can yeah. often feel like that um so it's great to have you here we're gonna we're gonna dive in um to sort of all kinds of stuff but i guess um it would be cool uh to get a little bit of your um backstory because you're you're you know I, i've come across your work I, th I think for a few years i've been following your your experiments i guess um with you know real interest um and what you've been getting up to and um, and I'd love to dive into, you know, where you are today and what the, the projects and the missions that you're on. But um, I, um, it would be cool just to get a little bit of, uh, just for the listeners to get a bit of your, you know, a little bit of your backstory. So I guess uh, to sum it up, I, I, uh, I'm originally a designer from the Netherlands. Uh, and I think as I was studying design, so really uh, designing products and chairs and whatever things I got quite aware of the problems it creates. And uh, we and humans in general are still seeing a lot of documentaries and how the oceans are going bad, how there's a plastic problem, a problem with all the clothes we produce, just a lot of problems. Yeah. Uh, so I think o over time I started focusing more on, on, on that, like trying not just to design something new, but sort of working on mm, complex problems. Uh, and I think, uh, yeah, from there, all the projects uh, initiated, I guess. Yeah. Did you, because I, I guess it's interesting because did you, when you went into design, w was it a discovery, this kind of, because a lot of your projects, which we'll dig into, um, as you say, are, are focused on the sort of the, these problems of, of overconsumption, of waste of materials, of, of how we've been making things, I guess. Um, so was that a sort of discovery as you were going down this design pathway or, or was it your intention? So I think in general, when I started design, I thought it was super cool to make a chair, uh, put your name <laughs> on it, little signature and then sell it. Sounded like cool. Um, but as I got, uh, as I was studying, I think I started watching like, uh, Zeitgeist was a big one, or the story of stuff, uh, which is oh, yeah. how Annie stuff is made. Yeah. And, and then you realize, wow, well, everything is kind of designed from our financial system to the production of clothes to whatever. Uh, and then if you see the problems it creates, it's almost hard to not work on that. Uh, so I think, yeah, it sort of, uh, I, I feel like all those documentaries and stuff sort of inspired me to, to work more on it. Yeah. Because it is, um, I, is, is, I think it was like, um, which I think was quite a nice place. So was, I think it was about was it four or five months ago I saw a video piece of film that you put out, which was um, Goodbye Dave Heckens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, uh, it, was a, it was a film of you kind of um, shooting yourself with a chocolate edible pistol. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you were sort of reflecting on, this kind of journey of this you know this individual designer um and you use that again in in the sort of widest sense from sort of artist to you know anyone kind of in our culture i guess who who, who sort of builds a i guess a name around their themselves um and through the work that they're putting out into the world and as you point out in the film tend to get a lot of attention and awards and <clears throat> but uh, but you were sort of saying you know the reality is it's obviously takes, 
you know, a big team of people to make stuff happen. And behind any kind of design name, there's a whole crew of folks. Um, and you were, you felt it was time to finish with, uh, Dave Hackins as the designer, um, which again is really interesting on so many levels, but it's refreshingly humble as well in a culture, which sort of, you know, is, I guess we, you know, we sort of have this sort of the culture of individualism is so strong. Um, can you share a little bit about that? Like what was the shifts for you to make that call? Yeah. So I think it, it's uh, one of those things for some reason, if you um, are a design or an artist, a musician, you sort of often end up using your own name, uh, maybe because you really just start on your own as well. Uh, so it's the most common thing to do, which was in my, uh, my, yeah, was the case for me. I graduated, it was just me. So I used my name. But then, um, yeah, over time, projects grow, people join, uh, and it's still sort of linked to your own uh, name, which uh, becomes sort of a bit of a brand for people. Like it's almost not an, a name anymore, but it always made me feel very weird uh, that, uh, yeah, I don't know. It feels like we operate as an organization, but for some reason we link it to one person. Hmm. And uh, I think it's also a bit weird for the one person <laughs> because it's sort of very central, uh, sort of not very healthy, I would say. Uh, and it's also not really fair for, every, for everyone that is helping with the project um, because yeah, everyone helps and everyone is needed. Uh, so yeah, but this is one of those things, I think just because I studied design, I naturally sort of evolved into, into this. And we've been working like this for like six years or something. And I was always a bit in the back of my mind, but now it was like, okay, it's time to sort of set this straight uh, and remove that name. But it's a bit uh, tricky as well, because at some point, I don't know, people know the name, your YouTube account is that name, your Instagram, <laughs> whatever, like it's all linked on that. And also just on the backside of things, like the financial structure is built on that name. Uh, so there are quite a lot of things to change in order to make that. And I think that's also one of the reasons why, I don't know, it takes a bit of time to do that. And I think for me, one of the reasons was also like, um, people tend to link mm, mm, a person to, let's say a mission or from a company or whatever. Hmm. And then if the individual does something weird or funny or strange, it affects like the whole organization. So there's a lot of, uh, not sure if pressure is the right word, but maybe responsibility on that one face of the organization, mm -hmm. which I think can be very powerful. If you want to get a message, you have that person saying it and everyone sort of understands it because that's the person and the face they know. But I think it's also a bit dangerous as in, I could see myself doing something stupid in the future. Um, but then it would affect a lot of things because it's my name and everyone works under that name and stuff. So, uh, I think that was also one of the reasons that it feels more secure if you really go for a mission to not link it to a person but to link it to a cause uh, mm -hmm. so that even if i would be done with it i could step out without the whole thing falling apart because yeah it's not me it's just the yeah. mission that sort of counts yeah no make, makes total sense so you you were i guess a lot of your um your you know your early work particularly you know there was Phone blocks and precious plastic, I guess, were two two pretty big projects that you started right in your as your uh, in your design education, your graduation projects. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I think they were. Yeah. Um, and um, you know, they they you know, I guess, con and continue right to to evolve in different ways. Um, can we just can we talk just a little bit about um, because I guess they're quite different, really. But I guess the um, but phone blocks focused in on these these um, these devices, these smartphones that are constantly being upgraded and pushing us to you know to keep purchasing more and more or becoming obsolescent or whatever. You, the whole system, yeah, is sort of geared towards more and more. So, mm -hmm. phone blocks, was, I guess, was a bit, was a was a response to that in in many ways and and got huge amounts of engagement as a as a concept. Can you tell us a little bit about that and like where it came from and? So, yeah, so in general, it was a, a, a graduation project and I had pressure plastic and phone blocks. And I saw phone blocks always as the small project because I didn't really do much. It was just an ID. Uh, yeah. I thought uh, I put it online because I think it makes sense for me. Um, and then just let's see. 
So the idea was basically that you have a phone that is modular. So if a, repair, uh, a part is broken, you can just replace that part. Um, but also if it gets slow, you can uh, replace only that component, so not the entire phone, how we do it nowadays. Or uh, you could even customize your phone. So maybe you like a big battery, so you do that. Maybe you prefer a bigger camera, or maybe you even have a glucose meter for your diabetes, whatever. So it would sort of mm, make phones much more uh, open and mm. much more, so you don't throw the entire phone away when the part is broken or outdated, but you can just uh, replace just that part. And it, I would say it's kind of, uh, it sounds easy, but it's a complex thing because it's not how our electronics are currently designed. Mm. Um, but for me, it also felt like just sort of a thought what it could happen. Uh, maybe 10 years from now, we work in this direction. Um, but yeah, then it on the internet, a lot of people uh, were quite into it. They really liked it. So it became a bit, uh, I guess, bigger than originally intended. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how, how did, how have, I mean, what's your sense of, have you had any kind of, you know, manufacturer? Because I guess there was a lot of these things provoke and, and you know, and manufacture responses or, or has it led to anything that you're aware of in terms of? Well, so back then, um, uh, I got in touch with Google and they were yeah. developing uh, sort of something along these lines. Um, so uh, they were like, hey, maybe come check out our project. And it's called Project Ara. And uh, at that point, it was still just a very brief ID uh, and some 3D prints they had and stuff, but nothing, er nothing, not much. But then they saw because of phone blocks, oh, there's a massive demand for something like this. So it kind of boosted up that project. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, they started developing the modular phone, uh, which was kind of impressive, actually, in two years, what they made. Uh, and at that time, you also had a few other brands looking into it from small startups to some Chinese manufacturers to make more modular phones because they just saw, wow, there's a big demand for modular phones. Maybe we should make something for that market, mm -hmm. um, which was kind of interesting to, to observe, actually, that, that it changed a bit. But Google, by far, I would say, put the most resources at it. Um, and after two years, they had this quite functional phone. I mean, the first time when I came there, it was the size of a fridge. And at the end, it was really like the size of a phone and obviously it was not a consumer model. There was still like a lot of stuff to figure out, but it was pretty impressive, I would say, how they built that. Um, but then at some point, Google decided to focus more on uh, software. So they removed a lot of hardware projects and this was one of them. Right. Um, so then the project just kind of killed. Um, so up until now, uh, there hasn't really been this one mm, manufacturer that built a modular phone. Again, yeah. also because it's just really complex. Um, but you do have a few phones that sort of take the philosophy in mind. So for instance, Fair Phone, it's a Dutch phone brand. Yeah. That makes more ethical phones. They now have this, that you can upgrade your camera so you don't throw away the whole phone. Um, Shift Phone is a startup from Germany that has more upgradable phones. So um, yeah, it's more these smaller brands almost trying to make that change. <clears throat> yeah, so often I, I used to do quite a lot of work with Nokia y years ago, and when sort of pre, pre pre the Apple smartphone days, when they ruled the world of phones, Nokia mm -hmm. and uh, and the, the, this kind of thing would be something that they would be, you know, they would have sort of teams looking at ideas like this, but they would actually actually kind of um, getting um, uh, a rollout of a product like this was always just always really tricky because their whole systems again were sort of designed to to churn out such massive numbers and, you know, based around a sort of way of building something. Um, it always seemed quite hard to disrupt that, those models in these bigger businesses. Um, but, um, yeah, it's interesting. You don't, is that right? You don't, you don't actually have a smartphone. Is that right? <laughs> uh, at the moment I have one since I'm in Portugal, actually, <laughs> but I didn't have one for like two years. Yeah. Uh, no, I How think I was actually not not necessarily from the technology point of view, but more just the addiction. Like it's too easy to look at something. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Well that's yeah, I mean that's this interesting thing, isn't it? It's kind of like all these um when you add all these layers of of possibility and <clears throat> functionality and you know, what what is the what are these other sort of side effects that you know are created in how we how we show up every day. <laughs> what we do and don't do. Um, 
I had to know actually how I started using a smartphone again after two years was my bank. I had to log into my bank and they had this thing before that you could have like an external thing, but they skipped uh, having that. So they say, you need to have a smartphone now. So it's like, damn it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then when I started using a smartphone again, after two years, I realized, well, oh, there's a lot of services linked to this thing. Yeah. Kind of a powerful device. Yeah. I, you, I, bet, I bet you've noticed a lot in two years, did you, about, about uh, how things that's evolved? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, But I, I guess I still have a very old smartphone, so I, I cannot <laughs> run all the latest stuff. Um, <laughs> But yeah, for sure, it makes a lot of things smoother on a smartphone. Like I was used to the web experience on a laptop, but I, I feel like that's been neglected over the years uh, and they're focusing on, on, on apps and phones. So most of the experiences are way smoother on the phone. Yeah, yeah it's mad. So, um, so Precious, I mean, you've done it. I mean, if you, I mean, we'll get, let's get into, let's get into Precious Plastic if we can, because that was, that again was a, a graduation project, right? But that that really blew up this pressure, and it still is, right? It's still, sort of, you know, doing its thing and growing and being experimented with. And could you just, for the sake of our listeners, just just give a little bit of a, yeah, just explain a bit about precious plastic, what it is, or maybe like why you started with this this idea and and maybe where it is today. Yeah. Um... So yeah, Precious Plastic was a project uh, trying to work on uh, the plastic problem. So we have like waste everywhere in the world, floating on beaches, fish eat it, like it's polluting our environment. So I was thinking there like, what could we do? And um, so I started building machines to recycle plastic. Um, and in a way they already exist, but they are super expensive and only for very big industries to have. So I decided to simplify those machines and make them open source so people all over the world could replicate them. So uh, because the plastic problem is really all over the world. So in this way, you could empower anyone that wanted to do something with it to to actually do it. And also because in my eyes, precious, or, uh, plastic is a precious material. So it's, it's a resource that is just laying around for free. And we see it as waste. But if you have the right tools, you can actually turn it into something new and even sell that or make a business out of that. So it was really creating these machines uh, that empower people to start turning that waste into something valuable that they see around the world. And uh, yeah, also this one was uh, released together with phone blocks actually, because they were both graduation projects. So the one was about uh, trying to do something about all the electronic waste. And this was about plastic. And personally, I was always quite into the plastic project because it felt a bit more, you can actually do it. You can build a machine, you can share it online and like, it's, uh, yeah, is quite direct. Building a phone always sounds super complex to me. Like I wouldn't even know where to start. So my my intention was to really continue on fresh plastic. But then when I put phone blocks online, the whole like everyone liked phone blocks and no one yeah, really the internet fell over. <laughs> um, so yeah, I started working on phone blocks a bit. Um, but then when that hype was a bit done, I started continuing more on fresh plastic and really trying to make that better. Uh, yeah. And tell us, because because um, so you but you, you again, and you know we can go into this because uh, you know your it seems to me anyway uh, th- th- this kind of openness, this sharing knowledge, learning, working very openly. It's a real sort of strong strand of how you like to work, and <clears throat> just even hearing those two examples with the you know the phone block is obviously phone block is you know you're still sort of you know you're kind of like you're not able almost to sort of um infiltrate the the current system that sort of builds devices whereas with precious plastic you're you're basically trying to sort of open it up to people and say look this materials this waste is everywhere um but actually we can reimagine it and reuse it in in multiple ways so i'm going to help develop tools that allow people to to do that um because you you then um you could you figured out how to uh make this kind of it's quite a simple uh, piece of machinery right that you just des- design and enable people to be able to purchase and then all the kind of documentation and tools that they need to actually go about and create things um did you where did you, did you start doing that in a physical place to start or how did how did it just tell us about how it spread because it spread it's spread like all over the shop hasn't it there's sort of people using machines all over the place and yeah um well so it started just uh, me watching youtube videos on how plastic uh, molding works and uh, trying to prototype like simpler machines. And then um, 
at some point I, I, fa- I thought we have a sort of a good machine. Uh, so I put the drawings online, uh, quite basic, so people could replicate it. So I was quite excited because, I mean, it's open source. Everyone in the world could suddenly do it. Mm. But uh, no one really did. Two people rebuilt that machine. So I was like, ah, okay. Um, so maybe I could improve stuff more on the... Maybe the machines could be better, but maybe also the documentation more clear. Maybe you should have videos so it's easier to follow. So with a smaller team, we started working on that to try to improve. And uh, so we call that version two of the project. Uh, mm-hmm. And when that one came online, it really spread it way more around the world. Um, and uh, so it really grew more of a global community. And then after after that, it was cool. But we're like, well, it would be cool, for instance, if you have a map that you can see all the places or an online marketplace where people can buy and sell things from each other. So you could really create an economy. So then we started building that. Um, so we always expand sort of these tools. And sometimes it's a machine. Sometimes it's a digital thing. Sometimes it's a product. Sometimes a mold. Just whatever it takes, I guess, to get more people uh, recycling plastic. And, and so, yeah. Uh, fresh plastic feels to me less like an explosion of everyone started. It's really just every time we improve it, we just see it getting better and more people joining, uh, which is a fun process actually to do. Yeah, and because then you did the, because um, I sort of seem to vaguely remember you'd got, you, you know, you'd sort of yeah, you'd got this, you got these prototypes out, and you'd started to build community, and things were starting to go. And then I just remember seeing something where you just, I think it was a piece of film or whatever, but you were like, right, I'm I'm looking for a hundred. 100 people designers and all kinds of folks to come and uh come and live and work in a warehouse in in holland to try and take precious plastics to the next level um and uh and you got some i think you got some some was it some foundation funding or something to to make mm-hmm. that happen but and you're sort of doing this big call out to be grand. T- tell us about that because that looked it looked um it looked like a pretty extraordinary uh um thing to do um tell us about what what led you to actually doing that and then can you just maybe just tell us mm-hmm. a little bit about that and what 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 you learned from that experience all right uh, yeah so in general i would say uh, we i always see a lot of things that could be improved for fresh plastic but there's only so many uh, hours you have in a day and so many resources so in the first version it was really just me then the second a few people joined and the third version a few more and we also started getting some donations. Um, so if people support the project, there's way more we can do because it doesn't really have a business model. Um, so uh, then at some point we won an award of 300,000 euro, which was like by far the most money we ever <laughs> seen. Uh, and also the local municipality in the Netherlands back then, they had an empty workspace, which they, we could use. And they said, we want to do something. Uh, so that aligned pretty well because there was like a big workspace, we had budget and we had a lot of things that we thought could improve for fresh plastic as always. Um, so we figured maybe it would be cool if we make a whole list of things you want to improve. We use this space to host people that want to help on it. So still volunteers, um, but we could now have a lot of volunteers and make it nice for them. So giving them a house, food um, to make sure they don't uh, lose any money and also pay so all the money basically goes into those things and uh, materials, just really prototyping um, experiments, metal, like this kind of stuff. So uh, yeah, we invited like people to come uh, to make this version four, we call it. And that was quite intense uh, with a lot of people working. I, everyone was super passionate from all over the world. It was really, really cool actually, met a lot of people. And uh, over the, I guess, one and a half year that it took, we had over 110 different uh, people coming. And Amazing. usually there were like around 50 on average uh, there because some people could only stay for three months due to a visa or they just had other things to do. So it was a bit, uh, some people stayed all the way. So yeah, it was a, a lot of people coming and involved, which uh, gave the project, I would say, quite a big boost because before the team was always so small and so little resources. And now we could really go into all the little details that we always thought we could improve, but we just never had the money or resources for it. What was, what was, what did you see was, what was the sort of thread, the common, the commonalities that was bringing people towards this experiment? What did you notice out of the, these different folks that came and took part yeah. with you? 
Yeah, I think a lot of people, uh, I guess, uh, as me, that they just see all these things that are wrong in the world or they hear all the problems. But it's really hard to find maybe something you believe in or something that you believe could change it. Uh, and I think fresh plastic had that a bit because that was purely our intention to really change this plastic problem. And uh, we didn't have any like strange business models around it or working for another kind of company. It, it felt very pure, I think. And it was also exciting. No one really, I mean, it was the first time we ever did this uh, or maybe any open source project. I don't really know. We had very little examples of how to structure this. So I think there was also this excitement of like, no one knows how this is going to go. Uh, but you meet a lot of like-minded people and you just give it all you have and see if it makes sense, if it works like this. Amazing. What was, um, what was some of the, you know, are there any specific like highlights that you can just, you know, really stand out for you with that experience? Mm, yeah, I think just in the days when everyone knows what to do and uh, everything is set up, it feels really impressive. Everyone likes what they do. They all enjoy it. They make progress. They work on this cause that they believe in. It felt very, uh, I don't know, beautiful way of working almost compared to how I got to see many other people working, which is something maybe they don't necessarily like. Mm. Um, so I think that felt really good trying to give people space to do that. Um, it was also, I would say at moments, very intense. If you live and kind of work with the same people on quite a passionate project, uh, it's just a lot. There's always more to do. Everyone always has good ideas, always things to try, like, and it's all very exciting, but it's hard to just take a break or a rest out of that uh, very exciting bubble almost. Yeah. And did you, did you, <clears throat> how did you find sort of, or how did you approach, um, direction and decision making and that kind of stuff was that also an experiment as well in terms of how do you or did you have a very sort of yeah just be curious of how again in sort of more because it sounds like quite a sort of self-organizing type environment yeah, in, in general we uh, we knew how to build machines and, and websites but not really how to structure people because we never really had an organization Mm. We always had in the back of our mind this project, what we do now here in Portugal, to sort of find a way to work and live in a place uh, working on something, a cause that you believe in. So we were very keen on, on trying that out. So in that way, I would say this experiment with these, uh, in this workspace was also uh, a big learning for that. Like, how do you structure people? Because everyone has good intentions, everyone is passionate, but it's easily still chaos if it doesn't have the right direction. So we had quite some internal uh, discussions as well, like how much, for instance, how many rules should we have? Should we say everyone starts at 10 uh, and eats at one because it's easy for people in the kitchen. They know how much to cook and that there's no noise when you're eating. Um, but some people also like to work the freedom or they write, like to work super late and then uh, start late. So uh, you come into all these little things, uh, like how to structure just a group of people that all have good intentions, but how to make that in a way that it doesn't become chaos. I feel like we spent quite a lot of time on that, trying to <laughs> manage. Um, but it's also kind of interesting because it feels very much like, yeah, we should know how to do this, no? Because that's kind of what you want, that you can work on passion with something without uh, being obstructive to other people. So uh, some people had a bit more experience with this. Some came from a community, some worked in companies before. So I think it was in general a very open process and we just all shared what we didn't like, what we liked and uh, just tried new things throughout uh, the year to see what works best for us. And where, where was the, and so now with, with precious plastics, you came, you, you know, you came to the end of that of that particular phase, that particular experiment, how did it, how did that sort of come to a close and wh what's the evolution now? Where, where, where is it at? Well, so, at, so we had this, before we started this whole to-do list of things to improve, like yeah. making a few products, making a few machines, building an online website better, like a lot of things. Um, so at some point that was ready and the money was also finished. Um, so that was no more food, food. <laughs> yeah, no more food, no more houses. Um, and the work was done. Um, so that was kind of nice. People uh, left. And yeah, I guess the whole team uh, just became digital now. Like everyone is still in touch, but there wasn't a physical space where we would work. 
But that's kind of also nice once we put it online, you have a lot of new knowledge. Like suddenly we had, for instance, a machine that could make sheets or we had business models. So it would help people to make calculations that they could make a profitable, sustainable business on recycling. Uh, so it's always exciting to put this online and then see what the community does with it. Um, and that's about a year ago now. Uh, so then we always just observe like w- what goes on, uh, how is the community using it, and and like should we improve something else again? Like should we have a new version? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. And what? And how is the how is the community sort of the pressure plastic community? What what can you? What is where where are the, where is their energy right now, and what what are people up to? Um. So in general, you have sort of uh, what, what is actually super nice that happened after this experiment with a lot of people is that there was a small dedicated team that said, we want to continue pressure plastic and figure out how can we sustain ourselves that we don't depend on winning an award or something. Mm, mm. So um, they uh, went to France with a small team of like six people to figure this out, uh, to build some machines, to do more collaborations. Um, so on the one hand, you have that, which is a bit now maintaining fresh plastic. Um, and then you have the global community and, uh, and this is quite diverse. You have some people that really started five years ago. So they have already established quite a little business and some people are just getting started right now. Um, so everyone is a bit in different uh, steps, but, uh, I think a big focus is at least for us is really trying to make sure they can sustain themselves. So in the beginning we had a lot of idealists that just saw there's a lot of waste. Let's do something about it, which is great. But after half a year or something, you need or a year, you need to find a way to be able to continue to do that. So we really try to help them with that um, because, in the end, that's quite effective if they can continue to do it. Yeah, and like what? What? I mean, can you share any like what? Are, are there some sort of surprising stuff that people are doing with this? This you know, these tools and these machines and this approach, is there stuff that you've got like, no idea that, that could happen or like, what, what are people, what are people tackling or are, or, or are people sort of developing? Yeah. You know, new products or things which are, which are kind of, yeah, been a bit of a surprise to you. Yeah. So in general, I, I always like to see it in different settings. So if we build a machine here, it's completely different if you run it in an island in Indonesia or in Africa or in Russia. So for me, that's always very fun to see how people uh, use it in their uh, own spaces mm. and very valuable feedback as well to, to for us to improve the machines. Um, but in general, I would say, uh, yeah, just a lot of stuff that people try. Some work very detailed, some work very rough, uh, some make new machines and then others uh, build upon that. So it's, uh, but I would say though, they're, I feel like they're often like details of things. Uh, because really, like, for instance, developing a completely new machine takes a lot of resources to do a lot of prototyping, a lot of testing. So that's often also maybe a little bit where we would come in place more to really try to do that, to bring people together, find a budget. Because just for a workspace uh, uh, that recycles plastic, to be able to fund that as well, it's quite hard. I think that's also a bit like how we see our role, that the big developments, we try to find a way to make them happen. So the whole community sort of benefits from that. Because if once we share a new machine, everyone can sort of use that. Mm, nice. <clears throat> so there's a, there's a, there's a bunch of projects that I, that I, you know, can see that are live for you now. And um, I'm fascinated about project camp and, you know, the Portugal, adventure that you're now on and we can would like to get into that but i guess i guess it a lot of this is 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 well at least it seems to me is is um is sort of connecting into this into the one army idea um um so maybe we could just maybe we could just talk a little bit about one army and like Mm -hmm. you know because i think it was like after you shot yourself with a chocolate gun i think that was the start of one army right Mm -hmm. um so tell us a bit about that what is it and where did it come from and what's the sort of mission that you're you're on with it uh, yeah yeah indeed so after I, I i shot myself and killed my name dave hackens we call it one army and we've already been internally sort of using that for a while because it often feels like like that like uh, if you have a massive global problem like for instance plastic pollution you need like an army to tackle that like so many people need to be involved 
Um, and that's just one problem. I mean, you have way more of those complex problems. So it really felt like uh, for us that we were also building communities that are very individual, like not individual, but uh, like for instance, Fresh Plastic has a very specific community. Mm. Uh, and then uh, people that work on fashion has its own very specific community or people that work on Project Camp, they like sustainable living. It's a very specific community. But in a way to sort of not have uh, global problems, I think they all sort of need to interact with each other and because they all affect each other. Um, so, uh, and I think often the people also have the same mindset, the same intention, but just sort of a bit a different project where they're currently in. So we decided to create this uh, foundation, One Army, which is sort of the umbrella of all the projects. So uh, it sort of connects all those uh, communities and projects together. We live on a life-giving rock called Earth, hurtling through space. How bonkers is that? You're listening to the Spaceship Earth podcast. Yeah, I love it. And you was the description of so it's a, your global movement of peaceful sapiens dedicating their lives to serve and protect planet Earth. Love yeah. that. We need more. We need more of that. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, it's fascinating because, as I said, you know, I, I have a, um, a, a sort of, a, I guess, a side project experiment that's been running about 10 years, good for nothing, which is it has tended to try and draw people around problems. Um, and originally through sort of, you know, like, hacks um but we started trying to sort of draw people from kind of creative and commercial backgrounds who are sort of you know doing amazing stuff but always on behalf of clients and you know in pursuit of usually sort of making more things for people that we didn't need and but these you know really great humans with brilliant skill sets and then trying to sort of like invite them into kind of issues um um, often on the ground in, in places. So we'd often look at sort of, um, you know, place-based problems, which could be anything from, you know, <clears throat> pollution, food, inequalities, whatever, but then bringing, um, inviting talent to come and, you know, spend a day or two days working, you know, very experimentally um, to try and prototype things. And there's always this sort of extraordinary you know, just amazing energy. And it just, when you were talking about precious plastic, it was reminding me of that again, of when there's this sort of, when there is this kind of um, deeper purpose that people really feel, you know, really feel strongly about the need to tackle. Um, <clears throat> often, you know, that that can be such a strong motivator, you know, just, the, just that, that kind of mission um, of getting people kind of, you know, working in new ways and, you know, coming with different perspectives but able to sort of collaborate and um so I, w when i hear of you know when you talk of one army it, it makes <clears throat> it makes um so much sense and this idea because you you sort of organize around yeah problems and projects right is sort of how you mm -hmm. think about one army um at the moment and you you've got um you know you've got the next evolutions of your your own projects that have, you know you've talked to um, that you've been developing and is, is this right? So my thinking is you're, you're sort of working with this community that you've, that has been built around the different projects that you have, have been working on over the years. And then the idea is to sort of build a kind of one army, you know, sets almost like tools and practices and things that you can then actually open up to other folks. Is that how it's sort of working or is that? Yeah. So I think in general, for instance, now with fresh plastic in like six years working that, Mm. We learned quite a lot in how to build a community around a problem. Mm. Um, so n now we, what is it, next week, we release a new project uh, called Fixing Fashion. Uh, oh, yeah. And a lot of things we learn in Fresh Plastic, we can apply there. It's almost like copy-paste in terms of how to structure and organize uh, things, mm. which is quite um, useful information, I would say, for building communities around a problem. And uh, for sure, it's something we we think is very valuable to do and very powerful. Uh, we see definitely one army doing that in the future to, to share the ways how to structure these communities. I would say though, at this moment, it feels like we don't really have the answers yet. We're still trying yeah. ourselves. Um, but yeah, definitely already learned a lot. Um, 
But I think one of the things is also that uh, deep down, I think we also uh, think that all the humans on earth want to help. They all have good intentions and they all want to contribute to something. And some do it more active than others. But I think end of the day, uh, yeah, that's kind of the intention of everyone to do the best they can. Um, but it's often just uh, maybe uh, you you're building something that might not actually be a solution. And I think this often happens if you get very isolated into certain areas. So for instance, um, many of the problems we have now were solutions uh, in the past. So plastic at some point became was a solution because uh, we needed to produce more things on a quicker scale. Uh, so a lot of these uh, problems are quite interwoven with each other. Mm. And I think that's also one of the reasons to create one army, to have a bit more... Um, interaction or communication between the different problems and uh, and the different uh, areas people work in um, because yeah trying to avoid that you think you're working on a solution but maybe you don't have a quick enough feedback loop or you don't realize that you're actually making a mess somewhere else so project camp because it fascinates me what what you're doing there and and i think that speaks as well to i think there was something i read i can't remember where you were uh, you know, you're sort of talking about, you know, you've been looking at kind of, you know, how to prototype solutions to a lot of problems, but you're kind of now trying to prototype a way of living that is less wasteful, which is almost impossible in our current system. So let's get into this because this is this is pretty huge, right? If <laughs> tell yeah. us tell us about that and where that came from, and 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 currently what Project Camp uh, means and what it's up to. Mm, yeah, so that started a little bit by uh, just when I lived in the Netherlands, that uh, even though you work on a, a project that you hope fixes something, like plastic recycling, the end of the day, you go to a supermarket to buy something, like a banana shipped from Colombia. Then uh, you sleep in a house that is built from concrete. Uh, then you take a car somewhere. Um, so I, I felt, and then you have all the roads that are there, the lights that are always on, just sort of to keep that Dutch system going. Uh, it's not necessarily a Dutch system. I think it's just a Western system. Mm. Uh, they leave big footprints, uh, way more than people in other countries in the world, the Western world. Uh, so I, I felt very much like, damn, you're trying to fix problems, but you're here part of the problem just by living in this world. Uh, so I think that sort of started project camp a little bit like, okay, how, how should I structure life or how can we structure life that you can still work on these things, but meanwhile, you don't make a mess somewhere else. Um, so trying to find this, I don't know, a, a healthy way that you can still contribute, but also make sure your footprint is reduced. And, uh, and, and that's, that's, that's not, that's not, that's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, for sure. It's not a, it's not an easy one, but it feels like a, kind of a, a big one, maybe. Yeah. Or an important one to work on. So I think also we, we just wanted to prototype that. And then um, it, start, it felt like it started by having our own piece of land where we have some freedom. For instance, in the Netherlands, you have a lot of rules, regulations, uh, permits you need to have, which makes sense because you're with a lot of people on a very small surface area. Um, so that's one of the reasons to go to Portugal. You still have a bit more of that freedom here. You still have rules, but it's less than the Netherlands. Um, and, and yeah, trying to structure how, how how would you, how would this, what would this look like? And I don't have the answer. We're now in the middle of trying to figure it out. So what you're about, is about a year in, is it? Or is it? Or uh, is it? Yeah, I came here and, uh, well, we've been in it for a while, searching for land and stuff and exploring where we want to be. Um, but now officially started coming, I came here in November, so half a year now. Uh, yeah. So what's the, um, what's the current sort of prototype looking like? Tell us, can you share? <laughs> Very basic. <laughs> uh, so I think how we would see it now is when you come to a piece of land, there's really not much there usually. Um, so we're now focusing on setting up like a base camp, we call it. Um, which has some basic infrastructure to sustain. So you would have your electricity, uh, some water, uh, you would have a kitchen, washing machine, like just basic stuff. 
Um, so we also, back in the Netherlands, we built two shipping containers. We converted them into this. So one is a workspace with all our tools, and the other one is the town center, we call it, from Age of Empires. Um, but it has like a, a kitchen, a shower, washing machine. So those are now uh, yeah, coming to the land and yeah, really setting up this base camp. So we don't really know yet what, what, what we should do after that. Um, but that's, 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 your, that's your sort of core infrastructure. Yeah, exactly. Um, just yeah. to make sure we don't uh, freak out uh, that we do have certain standard we're used to, I guess, in this yeah, yeah. world. And, 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 so, way, and so you can answer, so, yeah, so you can you can exist and, and also, like you say, like, you know, continue to work on this stuff that needs that needs attention. So you're sort of you're figuring out what's the min, what's the minimum viable infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. So that's that's now. So also that we can invite other people to join. Um, because at the moment it's just two people there. Um, and then also doing a lot of research, like, uh, what is this neighborhood? Where, what are the resources around here? And if we grow, should we grow food and what should we grow? Uh, what kind of trees are here? Can we regenerate the forest? Because there was a big forest fire a few years ago. Um, what can we contribute as well to the region? Like what is sort of missing there? So trying to understand a little bit how we are positioned in the environment we are in. And so I think once we know that a little bit better and we set up base camp, we can really make more of a plan like, okay, well, what are we going to do here? Uh, so a bit yeah. of a sort of, um, almost sort of permaculture type approach, sort of understanding what, what, what this place is that you've now yeah. arrived in. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, because it's kind of easy to just build a building or to mm. uh, set up, I don't know, whatever, a big workspace, but you never really know if it's, it's needed, is useful. Uh, yeah, so we kind of want to do it a bit, I guess, conscious and careful uh, to not yeah. just build too much stuff. Uh, so yeah. It sounds like you're, you're already hitting on one, one, of the biggest, one of the big issues of our current sort of Western development obsessed ways of doing stuff maybe we don't spend enough time trying to understand what a place is calling for you know what i mean um, yeah, yeah. and it does feel a bit like that sometimes to me that we just don't observe or analyze enough so that's also yeah i guess trying to sort of take a bit of a approach where we should make we have the time for that mm. yeah. and how are the um how are the the local native population um thinking or fi how, how are you finding that or in, in terms of what you're trying to do and yeah, yeah i think everyone is actually uh so you have this thing where a lot of foreigners now come to places like portugal because there's more freedom uh and nice weather and stuff like this so there are quite some mixed feelings between people whether they like that or not like having people moving around uh or they prefer to yeah i don't know that it stick stays to the portuguese people but uh, so I was always a bit worried about that. But being here in this small town where really nothing happens, uh, you just see a lot of empty buildings, a lot, a lot of old people. I would say all our neighbors are basically above 70 uh, and they are all super nice people, super friendly, still working super hard on the land they have every day. But they have a certain sadness inside because they don't really see they see the place they really love and where they grew up but they see their children not wanting to go there because they all go to cities or they go to i don't know us or north europe whatever um so all these areas are getting very empty so everyone is actually super excited that we come there uh, to to give some love to that space and uh yeah to to see them that other people also care about it so that's actually been very nice. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it, it feels like that's, there's, that's a, you know, this whole area is interesting um, t for so many at the moment because of, you know, lots of reasons. There's the, there's, I guess the, the pandemic lockdown that has, that has sort of meant that many people have maybe gone out of the city or maybe got some have gone back to family or it feels like quite a lot has been shaken up in the last year in terms of, you know, physical places and mm. where, you know, where people might be being drawn to and, you know, what's, what is going to be the impact on cities as, 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 as we sort of potentially emerge from, from this stuff. And, and then I, and then this whole idea of this, you know, more sustainable way of living and 
how do you do that and how do we leave a you know a lighter footprint and it's so fascinating and I, it, it does feel like this land access piece is is going to be a huge part of it though right because i think it my sense is as many people that are, would be massively um on board with what you're doing and trying to figure out you know how to live more in community how to integrate more what they do with how they live and how to live you know with a, a much lighter footprint and more intentionally but ultimately so it goes back to what we talked about at the start about you know the the you know when we talk about systems of even manufacturing things like phones the systems make it very difficult for you know it's very difficult to have land access right or to get access to land um uh at least in here in the uk and other i'm sure other places it's you know it's it, people are it's very hard you know to find to be able to access land to be able to develop on it without vast amounts of money and so you just unlocking land access feels like a do you know what I mean? How does that happen? Mm. Like, how, how how can that be accelerated? Or um, yeah, so um, I would say, yeah. um, in a way, it's expensive upfront. Um, but so, for instance, our land was around hundred thousand euro for ten hectares. Mm -hmm. um, ten hectares could host a lot of quite some people. It seems like a lot of money, but if you compare it with uh, house in the Netherlands for like multiple people uh, over time, it's way more. So I think in that sense, having land is not necessarily more expensive, but you need a certain money up front, I guess. Uh, and also you need to sh change. Like you cannot live maybe in the place you are now because it's very dense and populated. So obviously mm -hmm. prices are higher. But if you just think about uh, whole Africa, there's a lot of land available. Um, so I think in that sense, there is land, but we just need to find a way to make that, uh, that, we, are, that we like it to live there. Um, but I, I would say that we always have this, uh, or now a bit like, like you mentioned, if you have, for instance, if you want to manufacture a phone and you want to use a phone, I mean, it has to come from somewhere from a factory and the minerals needs to come from something. So it requires a certain industry. So if everyone lives in a piece of land in the middle of nowhere, you cannot have that technology or it, yeah, it wouldn't make sense. Mm. So I think that's still a question also, I don't have the answer to, but very much on my mind with project camp, like how. How real is it to to live on your own, or do you actually just depend a lot on the previous on the on the other system that manufactures all your goods, and you're just uh, using that, but uh, not really paying almost uh, the toll for it because you're living in a yeah in a foresty area without seeing all the damages it does. So yeah, I think it's sort of a fine line between. Yeah, how much of the current system do we need to manufacture and have all the technology we want and 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 develop rockets and whatever uh or should we not do that at all or yeah is there a way for people to find a healthy balance in between yeah yeah and i mean you and you're you're you know you're <clears throat> at least i i think you're on you you're sort of modding you're modding a van aren't you or you're looking at again creating a kind of open um you're developing a way of, of, of creating a kind of um, a home in a van and then offering that up as a open source piece. And just, I mean, just, I would love to hear about that and where you're at with it, but just, but even just to what you're speaking to, you know, you know, our impact on, you know, or our sort of, you know, the impact on the resources that we're drawing to live, you know, often at least when you are, if you're, if you're, if you're va van living or living more intentionally, where you have you know where you can't just press buttons <laughs> mm -hmm. for um for heat or <clears throat> water or whatever i mean yeah you know that in itself does is a it's a huge it does create a huge shift because you become so much more aware of not just the resources you need um but also the waste that you're generating right because you have to sort of you know it's human scale you have to kind of deal with it um so there's something about sort of being in in connection with that which i think makes you less wasteful because you're you know you see it you understand like where this stuff's coming from or or how much you're using you know you're becoming more mindful because it's more yeah. it's more experiential whereas when we're just sort of you know flicking switches and stuff for our power and you know resources it's yeah i think we can be way more you know we can and you know our footprints just become bigger because um we don't really see it yeah we um, don't see the damage or resources it actually takes we sort of lose we lost touch with yeah how how big is our footprint even 
And if you have yeah. to your own water, you're way more aware. If you need to have your own <laughs> yeah. solar to make sure you have electricity, you become a bit more aware of it. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us, tell us a bit about yeah. Tell us a bit about the 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 van. The van. Yeah, the van, van was uh, a bit part of setting up this base camp, so that if you go to land where there's nothing, we would have these two shipping containers with all our basic utilities, and then we figured if we want to host a few people. Yeah, it makes sense to live in a van. So, uh, because one, you can move it around, but also uh, it's very basic setup to just have a nice bedroom because that's basically what it is. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I already live in it now for two years actually, but uh, since November it, it became more like where it was originally set up for to to have this base camp here in Portugal. Uh, yeah, so it was an old German army van. Uh, and then convert it into a house. And how is van life? Uh, I like it. Uh, it's yeah because of those things, you become a bit more aware of the footprint you leave. But I would say, though, it's also often feels like cheating. Because let's say before I lived in the, in the Netherlands for uh, like a year with the van. But then, I mean, I, I went to a bouldering gym to take a shower. Uh, I didn't really cook in there too much because we had a kitchen and a workspace. Uh, so it was really just my bathroom in that way. Uh, and I think that's often also, mm, it looks very minimalistic, fan life, which I would say it is. It cuts down a lot of things, but it's also like you're still uh, uh, using resources somewhere else as well. Or maybe you say, I don't have a lot of stuff, but maybe you have a big box at your mom's place with all your stuff. Uh, so yeah, there's always this... Uh, yeah, it, I would say it's still way more minimalistic than owning a whole house, but it's not as minimal as it looks, I would say, in just the van. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> I like that. I, I, it was a, what you, I quite like that um, the insight you had of, you know, with, the, with particularly when you're you're figuring out this land that, you know, you, the van, you can just move a van around and sort of, you know, mm. stay for amounts of time in different areas to sort of get your head around how the <laughs> the vibe of the land, which I thought, you know, yeah. it's, it's, I like that. It's quite nice. Yeah. Uh, way of not being forced to build too early yeah yeah, and it's also a bit of uh, it's kind of intense to go to a new land with very minimal resources completely new environment and if you have your van it feel, i already felt a bit like my house so if i put it anywhere i feel a bit at home so in that sense uh yeah, it, it gives you a certain comfort compared to being in a tent mm. <clears throat> there's something um you know i i'm sort of um quite fascinated interested in how you know the the um the sort of the kind of capitalist um, model seems to do everything it can to refuse its uh, its dependence on the natural world. It still seems to sort of believe that we're separate from nature. And uh, I think there's something very interesting about, you know, um, intentional living like you're talking to or living in vans or whatever, where you, at least in my experience, you, um, you, you do become way more aware of, of uh, our relationship, our interdependence with the natural world. And again, sort of, I wonder sometimes how, you know, modernity or highly urbanized lifestyles or whatever remove us from that, um, from that kind of, you know, that feedback, if you like. Mm. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't know where I'm going with it, but I always think something, some, some, something, something very positive, I think, about being sort of um, uh, spending some time at least living within a landscape, you know, um, mm -hmm. and being more in relationship with that, with the natural world as a way of sort of starting to understand our impacts on it. Yeah. yeah and I think it also helps you to understand, um, what do you actually need? Because I think otherwise you just copy paste what you had before, but mm. after being a while, very basic, you realize, ah, maybe I don't need this thing at all. Or I used to do it like that, but I don't really care actually if this thing is here. So it also helps a bit better to understand yeah, what what are really needs you have. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so you you've um, you've always like with with all of your projects and work, you you've always had quite at least again how I see it, a very sort of quite playful way of um, exploring these issues or these challenges that can be really knotty and overwhelming. But there's always quite a lot of sort of playfulness to how you. Um, how you experiment with these ideas and also how you share these ideas to others um, online uh, particularly and you know you've you, you've 
used kind of video you use video a lot and 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 you you tend to sort of riff on these things and put them out and they seem to be really well received by people and where does that come from with you because it's this um you know f- again for me i sort of see a spontaneity and experimentation as a big part of 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 how you work but um can you tell us a bit about that because you've got this also you've got this other project story hopper which is interesting mm. um um so yeah i just wondered whether you could just share a bit of 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 you know the storying side of your work and where that comes from and what mm. keeps you doing it uh well i think it's a bit um... I think in general, the internet is super powerful that you can just reach other people by creating something and then everyone can see it. I think it's a very powerful tool, specifically video. You can just tell a story very well. So it's a very good way to communicate um, things you learned or lessons or thoughts. So it feels very valuable for me to use that you can actually just have the power to do that. It's kind of impressive. Um, And I think it comes a bit maybe from a design background that I think I do like to make things clear and simple uh, or understandable. And uh, I think that's why stuff might look mm, playful or easy because it it feels like it was super complex and then you sort of digest a simpler version of it so people can understand it. So they don't have to go to the same complexity. And it's a bit same as with Press Plastic. Before we have a good machine, we made 10 prototypes that all went wrong but you're not sharing all of that. You just share the thing that went right. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that it feels like we're often trying to do that or even the, the knowledge we have in our mind, like it's usually very messy and unstructured. And then you sit down and you take all the best things that you learned in five years and you press them into a video. I feel like you can really, yeah, it's kind of impressive that humans can do that. They can put five years into um, 10 minutes and then you <laughs> kind of have the same knowledge almost. I noticed a blog post of a new the, a new project coming, fixing fashion. Can we talk a bit about that? Because that feels really yes, yeah. That feels that feels like a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's the same. It's been uh, uh, there in our minds for a long time that fashion also has a big problem in the world. Like the clothes we produce, that we replace them every season, and that we create big piles of waste. Everyone has a surplus, brings it to these donation boxes that go somewhere uh, and uh, very little is recycled, a lot is made from plastic. Like it's just, if you really dive into that one, it feels like, Ooh, okay, that's kind of a big it's problem uh, affecting many industries as well. Uh, and it sort of has this machine of, of um, they're kind of trapped in their own thing. Well, they, they need to make something new because that's where the business model is built upon. So it feels like over time, um, there are some companies trying to change fashion, uh, but it feels like they're often uh, trying to sell you something, like selling something new. Like maybe instead of having a plastic shirt, you buy an organic shirt, which is better, but it still feels like it feeds the, the same mechanism of you buy a new shirt, but you didn't need that shirt in the first place because your old one was still good. Um, so yeah, it's sort of this endless loop of... Uh, of, of buying more stuff yeah and uh, but i think that's also really the cool thing about fashion that fashion can make uh, anything look cool so let's say if you think about the clothes we wear like in the 90s or the begin 2000 or the 80s they all look super silly now but for some reason by using the right advertisement the right people we started liking this and this is really just shaped by humans like is no one telling us you should wear that thing um and I think that's where the, the power of fashion is as well, that uh, we could decide what we want to make cool. And uh, and this project is all centered around, okay, so what would good fashion look like? What, what does it mean at this point in uh, human life uh, or history? And I think at this point, it means we have enough clothes. There are like secondhand shops full of it. And we ship stuff even to Africa because we have too much. So we should start reusing our clothes, repairing them, upgrading them. Uh, so making sure they, we keep them longer. And, and we don't really like necessarily the looks or they feel outdated, or maybe that means you have a patch on your shirt. Uh, so they have a repairy look, but I think that's, we can make that look cool and we can make that the new fashion as well. So yeah, the project is all around that fascinating i mean this i'm i'm uh i'm re- recording this conversation wearing a, a a sweatshirt that my friend has she started a little 
label called Like No Other, and it's basically she's she's finding um, old dead stock, um, you know, garments that were made that were never sold, mm. um, that will be that will go to landfill. Um, that's how nuts the whole thing is, you know. It's like, <laughs> yeah, here's a bunch, here's a bunch of, and then she's getting, and then she's taking them on, and then and then using a sort of fun sort of lino print to sort of print sort of quirky, you know, things on for people, sort of customized stuff. So I've got one that says on air, so I can wear it when I'm recording podcasts. Um, but you know, and then yeah, just trying to figure out how how you work with these different waste streams, you know, but um. Yes, yeah, so I think that's a good example of someone trying to not necessarily produce something new, but trying to work from an existing thing that's already produced. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's also a bit, it feels a bit like the early stages of precious plastic. There was some recycling going on and on YouTube, some films and people trying stuff and uh, in fashion as well. You have like smaller brands working on this, uh, but it feels like it's time that this really, this industry starts changing a bit bigger um, so i think that's also one what we try with this new project to build sort of a community around it that once the people come together it's you know, our stronger force uh to make this change than small individuals uh, yeah and so um i mean that's it sounds to me like that that's um yeah it's it's it's, it's definitely a a thing that's getting lots and lots of interest right now it, 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 in many ways yeah may, maybe it does feel almost like where, where plastic was a couple of years ago um so it feels like there's a um and just even that beh behavior shifts you know i think of like i just look at it also you know i think of my son he's 16 and they're, you know they're depop you know it's like that's what they do they they much more willing to sell old stuff and buy old stuff mm. um whereas you know that and that feels really kind of normal you know or um interesting and uh so i think there's all these kind of behaviors that are sort of like you say are happening on the ground um uh which make this a really interesting space but it is it's a it's the same one it's a gnarly thing though isn't it because it's it's the that the fashion industry is is worth i mean insane amounts of money and the materials and resources and people that are involved in in it is enormous and then the mm -hmm. destruction that it's causing is off the scale as well and and yet it's sort of communicated in such a sort of like <laughs> um you know um well it's it's pleasurable isn't it or it's, it's kind of do you know what i mean it's sort of um so it, it's again it's got all these different dimensions going on um light and dark <laughs> and uh because I think there's there's also I, I guess with all of this stuff you know with all the work you're doing and there is also for me at least to me a sort of an unraveling and a letting go maybe as well that's required because you know I guess the other question is how much do we really need of any of these things as well right mm -hmm. and we've become so sort of you know wasteful because it's just been on tap you know and it's been easier and easier to consume and also you know the role of things like advertising is you know it's it's psychology you know it's it's been telling us for years that we we need all these things as well and we're not good enough <laughs> without yeah. them or you know so so you are we are sort of unraveling like it feels to me like the you know again there's a there's a there's a there's a sort of a letting go um that's required as well as a sort of fixing there's a kind of letting go that's needed to sort of re-establish kind of like what what we really need yeah, yeah, I think in general, that's uh, almost half of the problem as well. Like you can create solutions and you can come up with a more sustainable something. But in the end, uh, yeah, you should also in a way find a way to moderate and look what you actually need because you probably don't need all the things you have. You think you need them and you can win quite easily with that. Uh, if you don't buy that thing, it already saves a lot. And if a lot of people don't buy that thing, that's already a massive problem. Uh, or a, yeah, big contribution to a, a problem just by not buying the thing in a way it's so easy. Um, yeah. Cause there's some fun stuff with the, in the fashion space of just, again, you know, people have been doing these kind of like, um, you know, these like little challenges around, you know, auditing your wardrobe, getting rid of everything, keeping six items or 10 items, do you know what I mean? Wearing them, different combinations of them for a month or whatever, and seeing what that's like to just sort of work with constraints, you know, and, mm -hmm. 
Um, and actually that's really, it's actually, that's a really interesting creative challenge, right? Is to work with constraints and to, to work with less and actually just make more of those things. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's super interesting. I will look forward to that. And how, so how can folks, how can folks get involved in that? And, and generally on one army thinking about what's ahead this year and beyond what's, what's the plans and how can, how can people get involved? Mm, so I would say in general, we, we are like uh, mainly open source. So a lot of stuff you can find online, quite well documented. Um, fa the fashion project would come online uh, 19 of April, so soon. Um, and it's called fixing.fashion will be the website. Uh, nice. And then uh, you have one army.earth where you can find an overview of all our projects and all our news updates and the things we do. And that's kind of where it all comes together, all the projects. So probably that's the easiest link because then from there you can go to anything. Yeah, nice. And how does, um, as a question I was having just on on that, on the One Army, sort of how that evolves is like, how could other, um, you know, sort of intentional communities tap into what you're doing? So it strikes me like you were saying before, you've been, you know, you've learned a lot by, you know, from Precious Plastic and all these other projects, you've learned a lot about how to get communities working around issues and how to get you know how to get kind of prototyping and ways of working and but there are and there are you know there are lots of other sort of intentional communities that are you know that are sort of exploring kind of issues and problem solving and place-based issues and stuff so how how could how is there ways that communities can tap in as well to to one army mm. So what we're now, uh, one of the things we did uh, when we had uh, all these people to help building Precious Plastic is that mm. we started building our own software um, and it was uh, a way to organize communities online because we already had online communities, but they're often structured in like forums or uh, Discord, like sort of tools. But we felt they were very lacking to to build a good community. Um, uh so that's one of the things we're doing is really developing this software to help others to build these communities. And we would, we're now using it at Press Plastic. So it's called community.pressplastic.com. There you can see it sort of running. Um, but we would also use this in our other projects. But I think we sort of see that a bit as a tool that others could use and um, other communities. Um, and you can already use it now. It's open source on GitHub. You can take it. But I would say it's still very much under development. Like I mentioned, we don't really have the really good answers yet. It feels like we're still learning each project we do. Um, but for sure, I would say in a few years, we, we know better. And then probably the tool is also more uh, developed. So then I could see it being very uh, yeah, useful for other communities. But yeah, in a way, you could already do it now. It might just be messy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. What, just on that, what what is, you know, because you're doing stuff online, you do, you've, you're doing a lot of sort of physical place-based collaboration, and um, what are you still sensing is the is the kind of you know is missing, or what are the things that are still really difficult? Can you share anything in terms of like you know working in communities, prototyping, you know, you're building these tools and and systems? Are there are there still areas for you where you feel like you know? Um, you know, where you, where, you, where there's still kind of support missing, or I don't know, is there things that, that are still quite tricky to, to work in this way? Are there, are there mm -hmm. things that you still, yeah, feel, uh, need, need more, more focus and you can share about what you've learned? Well, so for us, I think, um, what we personally could use to develop our tools is like web developers to make this software. Yeah. Because we are more come from creative background, engineers, makers physical work and we're not very uh, like money coders um so i think just more the, the skill set we could use but i think something we noticed while building that online tool is that a lot of tools nowadays are uh so you have this superpower almost of the internet and we notice for instance patch plastic that the people that have a lot of information are not the one that sit behind their computer all day um, because they're sort of out there doing the stuff, shredding the plastic and recycling. But often online tools are centered around people that are most active, which are not necessarily the people that know the most. They just happen to be more on the computer. Um, so I think for us, one of the challenges in the coming years is how, how do you balance that out? How can you make sure 
that not the one that talks the most leads the conversation, but that the one that has the actual knowledge. And uh, I think this is, yeah, because for instance, now on, on a lot of online tools, you get points, like the more interactive you are, the more points, so the more trustworthy. I think this is kind of a, a flaw if you have community uh, building. And, and one other thing is what we also try to do is build a bit less around individuals. So instead of like really centering around people, we're trying to create more groups on, uh, online where people uh, manage sort of a, an account. So it's a bit, yeah. But anyway, these are like topics we just see as uh, missing in, in online ways to, to build communities. So we try to prototype and test alternatives for that. Yeah, amazing. Thank you, Dave, um, for sharing these uh, these stories and uh, your your projects. Um, super interesting. Thinking about the metaphor of the spaceship Earth, I always like to ask this question um, at the end of a of a podcast: is this uh, this idea of becoming crew um, uh, on the spaceship Earth? What, what does that what does that mean to you right now in twenty twenty one? Uh, yeah, I think it makes a, a lot of sense to start serving sort of your environment, uh, because, uh, end of the day, that's the stuff you're going to leave, uh, behind. And, uh, that is also what's going to affect yeah, you, I think, with your own mindset and your own happiness. So I think it's, it's good to start, um, yeah, becoming a part of that, uh, spaceship and trying to, to steer it in the right direction. Nice. Thank you so much. Um, it's been listening. <laughs> been cool to chat and um, love what you're up to. And uh, we will. I'll, I'll link out to all the all the projects in the show notes. And um, cheers, man. All right. So, hope you enjoyed that one. Um, do check out uh, the One Army platform and all the various projects. Uh, that Dave has been helping bring into the world. They're super interesting and, um, you know, just ready to go. People are playing with them on the ground all over the place. Um, so if any of this speaks to your curiosity, whether it's around fashion, plastic waste, phones, e-waste, uh, or just how we're sort of living day to day, um, definitely worth checking out. Um, as usual, if you like the podcast, please do uh, share it with others or give us a review or a rating on your listening platform whatever that is it's much appreciated and it does help more people find the show so give us a little cheeky review uh you can sign up to our monthly newsletter it gets episode updates and then other projects and creative inspiration uh, from me all in service to life um or you can now donate the price of a cuppa if you like uh, if you've enjoyed an episode um you can find all of this uh on uh, the podcast website which is uh, at uh, the spaceship.earth online or you can follow us on instagram at the spaceship.earth uh, i'm going to play out with a track um it's called glimmer in the dark which feels about right right now uh it's by trilucid and esque um look after yourselves out there uh thanks for listening until next time peace and out